I have a few minutes here. I just can't help but tell you a little bit about the seeing eye. I, I don't know which is the most marvelous, the hearing ear or the seeing eye. I do know the Lord has made both of them. That's a wonderful piece of equipment you got there that you're keeping with right now. There's a clear glass window here called the cornea. It's as clear as crystal. It doesn't have any blood vessels in it. Over here it has blood vessels, but the Lord knew better to put blood vessels in this area where you're looking through. And uh, that's really part of your skin. If you come down over the forehead, up under the eyelid, down across the eye, it's all really related to skin and the embryo, except this skin's as clear as crystal. Isn't that great? If you're going to have an eye to look, you have a window to look through. Wouldn't it be ridiculous to have a window and no eye to look through it, a window in your skin? And then uh, you see the colored part of the eye. That's the diaphragm. That's like the diaphragm on a camera. It opens and closes. It's all automatic. You don't have to set the f-stops, you know, as you look around. It's all, all automatic. And then in the middle is the pupil. And when you look in here at the iris and the pupil, you're really looking at someone's brain. It's just part of the brain. And, uh, you know, the Hebrews in the Old Testament knew about the pupil. They didn't call it the pupil. They called it the apple because it was the shape of the apple. And you've heard this expression here, the apple of my eye. Isn't it great to be the apple of somebody's eye? Uh, I was the apple of my dad's eye. Well, that expression comes from the Bible because you see the Lord referring to Israel, and I believe ultimately in referring to all of us since believers are children of Israel. He says that as they were in the desert wandering, he encircled him. He instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. That's where the expression comes from. It comes from God. And uh, King David, when he was being hounded and chased, prayed that the Lord would indeed keep him as the apple of his eye. He says, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. Now, why, did they call, uh, why, why do we have the expression, uh, keep me? as the apple of your eye. The word keep here should perhaps best be uh, translated protect. We call it a place we put something to protect it, a keep. And so what the Lord is really saying is that he will protect us as the apple of the eye. What does that mean? Well, if anything gets anywhere near your cornea to touch it, you'll blink. It's automatic. You don't have to think about it. It's a reflex. In fact, this reflex is so powerful, it's the last reflex to be lost at the time of death. Emergency medical technicians, if somebody is deeply comatose, they'll touch a little piece of cloth to the cornea right over the pupil, and if they don't blink, they're probably gone. The Lord wants you to understand that you're not merely the apple of his eye, as we use the expression, not knowing exactly what we mean, except we're very fond of something but that he is protecting us as we might understand that we protect the apple of our eye. Reflexively. Reflexively to the death. Even the death of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, there is a uh, fellow by the name of Sir Duke Elder who is, uh, I would say, Mr. Uh, I. He's written a multi-volume set of books that you can find in most uh, uh, medical school libraries. And Sir Stuart Duke Elder an Englishman uh, wrote a book in this series called The Eye and Evolution. And in the book, he says that uh, unless you're willing to get, engage in a lot of speculation and what have you, this has been a lot of thought that have been put on the subject of the origin of the eye, the vertebrate eye, with its inverted retina and everything. And he says that up to now, it's a problem that is as yet unsolved. This is in a book called The Eye and Evolution. I wouldn't have even brought this up. Except he goes further than that. He says, not only is it unsolved, but assuming you don't want to get involved with a lot of useless speculation, he says it seems little likelihood of, that we'll ever find a solution. So you got the picture? He says, we don't know anything about the origin of the eye, point one. Point two, he doesn't think we're ever going to know anything about the evolution of the eye. This is amazing. Did I forget to tell you that this book is 843 pages long. 843 pages to say we know nothing, we never will know nothing about the eye. Now, I'm pretty long-winded. I'd have gotten this across six, 700 pages easy. <laughs> but evolutionists are convinced that the uh, not only was the eye not created, it occurred by chance, and so having occurred by chance is not the least bit surprising. It's a piece of junk. Poorly made. Frank Zendler, who has a website, you can look this up for yourself. He's a retired professor like me, only he takes the evolutionary side of things. And he says that although the human eye would be a scandal if it were the result of divine deliberation, 
It would be a scandalous God who made such an eye. He says, there is a plausible evolutionary explanation of its absurd construction. You've heard of Richard Dawkins, wrote The Blind Watchmaker. That man knows more things that aren't true than perhaps anyone alive. <laughs> he says, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires leading backwards towards the brain. In other words, that the light-sensitive cells would face out towards the light, not the other direction. It sounds pretty good so far to me. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light. Wow, do they point away from the light? They really do. All mammals, all vertebrates. The retina is in upside down. Years ago, I used to work with a sheet film camera. It shows you how old I am. We had these big old press cameras that had the bellows, and you had to put the sheets of film in, load them in a holder. You did it in the dark, and it was quite easy to put the film in upside down. So the back of the film was towards the light rather than the front. And then you went out and you took all these pictures you never get again. You go into the dark and you develop them. <laughs> you end up with about 200 ukulele picks. And that's about all you get out of it. Uh, the film's end upside down. Well, that does it right there. Obviously, an evolutionist wouldn't even think of studying a retina to try to understand why it might be advantageous to have the film end upside down. Uh, he can afford to just ignore it. And this leads to bad science. Because if you ignore evolution and just press right on ahead and say, if the Lord did it, I know it's got to be, there, ha there just has to be a reason. Oh, well, you find the reasons. I could do an hour on this alone. Let's just back up a bit. The eye develops as a little ball that comes off the brain. This is the brain in the embryo. We're not talking evolution now. A little bud comes out. It's hollow. The ball gets pushed in sort of like an empty basketball here. And this will form the eyeball here. The iris diaphragm will be at this edge and that edge. Uh, this will be the retina, the inner layer. And this outer layer will be the choroid, which has a lot of pigment and blood vessels in, in our body. And in the middle is a space. And these two stick together. And God put them together so that they would stay together. But after the fall, just like marriages and everything else, they start coming apart. We call that a detached retina. So we can see the beauty of God's creation. And right over the top of it, we see the effects of sin. It's beautiful, but something's gone wrong. It's like running a Rolls Royce out of oil. Marvelous automobile, but it's really damaged now. And what about the